The following is a presentation of the Matt Talk Podcast Network. It's time to go on the mat. The Cedar Valley's longest running radio show devoted entirely to wrestling. Brought to you by Rolling Ford and the National Wrestling Hall of Fame Dan Gable Museum on 1650 The Fan. Welcome to On The Mat. I am Kyle Klingman of the National Wrestling Hall of Fame Dan Gable Museum. And we have a special show. It's not special because we don't have Doug Van Gelder. He always makes it special. But it's special because we have three guests. And we get to kick it off with one of my favorite people in the sport. Might be number one. Uh, He could lobby for that uh, through the years. If he would give me a hug, he'd definitely be number one. But that's uh, Mike Finn, editor of Wrestling Insider News Magazine. He went to Waterloo Columbus High School, but he's done great things for the sport of wrestling through journalism and just elevating our sport to the next level. Mike, welcome. Well, I appreciate it, Kyle. Thanks very much. No, no, you're my friend, you know, but you know, we've talked about that other thing and Someday, maybe on my deathbed, maybe you can give me one. Well, hey, <laughs> your your mom makes me pies. Your the rest of your family's nice, but uh, I just can't get that elusive hug from Mike Finn. I don't know what to do. I don't know what to well, do. You know, re- wrestlers do it when they win gold medals or you know, world or NCAA championships. Okay, that's true. If I ever do that, maybe you look for me. Okay, <laughs> <All right. laughs> or if you get some major award, you win a Pulitzer Prize. Maybe that. There that you happens. go. There yeah. you go. But, uh, hey, we're we're having a fun time with the season. Season. It's kicking off. Uh, a few yeah. things have happened, and uh, probably for me, the number one thing, I, I happened to, to watch the match. Uh, Mark Hall got beat, uh, a true freshman from uh, from Penn State, a guy that everyone's watching. Surprised by this? Yeah, i, I be honest, I did not really see the match myself. I just saw the results. Was that was at the Michigan State Open? Yeah. Um, and, right, he, uh, you know, once again, a, what, a two-time junior world champion yeah. uh, in freestyle, a six-time Minnesota State champion, uh, from from Minnesota, Apple Valley is now at Penn State. Uh, I, yeah, I was I was surprised. I got to admit it because I really was was almost thinking, almost hoping we'd see him with the Nittany Lions this year, only because I thought the Nittany Lions could use his power when it comes to the postseason. And it was an interesting match in that uh, you saw what you talked about with being good at freestyle. He really dominated on his feet. He had three takedowns to zero for Brucky from uh, from Central Michigan. Brucky got on top, got a four-point near fall, and that was really the deciding part of the match. Really shows the difference between collegiate and freestyle and that there is a little bit of growth to get into a, a program like Penn State and win at that high level. Yeah, let me ask you, Kyle, since you actually got a chance to describe the action. When he got caught in that four-point move, did, uh, did Hall try something that got himself caught? Or was it something that Brunke actually initiated? No, it was completely initiated, which was uh, which was really wow. neat to see that he just kind of got on top, wow. and it, it looked fairly easy when he was able to get that four point near fall. So, as wrestling fans probably know, but non wrestling fans might not know. The, the reality is, Mike, uh, a four point near fall is worth eight takedowns because you aren't oh. giving up any escapes. That's and, true. Uh, That's it, true. And and but also you got to think about Hall. How often has Hall actually ever been down? I mean, I know in even high school you, you have to be down for a certain period of time, but I can't imagine any high school rest are doing. And, of course, in freestyle, you don't even deal with that, right. someone riding you. So that has to be one of the biggest things that these young top uh, high school kids have to adjust to because everybody on the college level is going to be down and, and not just getting taken down. And, and let's face it, the guys that are – College wrestlers, they know how to ride. The best ones know how to do it. So, yeah, I, I was a bit surprised, but it, it was a, a, a it obviously it'll be great for Hall to learn from this. But where he's wrestling, he's got the best guy to help him, best guys, best coaches, best wrestlers to help him. Mike, we have a special season in that we have two returning Olympic medalists competing in the college scene. This has never <laughs> happened before. Do you think that the college wrestling world is going to embrace that and really have a good season because of it? Oh, I think so, and I hope so. I just, you just wish that the Olympics had more weight classes, yeah. that we would see this more. You know, I, you know later it, when December we're supposed to see at least the non-Olympic world championships where we'll see a couple more Americans, but you know they're, they're not collegians. But, but the point is I'm trying to make is that you know, yes, I think it would be fun if they fed off of each other. I think it would be great for 
you know, uh, eventually I do believe we're going to see women's collegiate wrestling more on uh, than just a few. And I think, wow, could, could the Olympics help that as well? So, yeah, I, I just – it's really fun. And the, and the individuals we're talking about, uh, Kyle Snyder and Jaden Cox, are dynamic individuals. So they're young. They're fun. They love to talk about the sport. So it, they are like the, some of the best role models for young athletes. You had a good plug for our show today. We have uh, Afsoon Johnston, who was the very first female – world medalist from the United States at the Women's World Championships. She did that in 1989. She'll be on our second segment. And then Scott Goodell from Rutgers. He is the head wrestling coach there. Their program had a great attendance Mm -hmm. at the uh, Mm -hmm. Battle of the Birthplace. And, Mike, when you hear things like that, you hear about great attendance, and it's not just the the Big Ten doing it. It's other programs like Princeton. Of course, Rutgers is now in the Big Ten, but not one that you would necessarily identify with right away. Uh, That that really has to feel good for you as a journalist to see some of the progress in that area. Oh, yeah. As a journalist, as a fan of the sport, I love to see it. Uh, I always had, frankly, I had a criticism for this sport in that I felt like it was such a tradition-rich sport that people continue to live in the past. When when faced with new problems, be it Title IX, cutbacks, financial cutbacks, academic demands, uh, which prevent people from transferring as easily as they did in the past, I thought we were stuck. But at least now we're, we're seeing coaches, young coaches, who are dynamic, who believe that they've got to make something happen, maybe just for the sake that they're keeping their job, to keeping that program alive, because wrestling needs more college programs. And, and is there anyone more progressive than uh, Brian Smith at Missouri, some of the things he does with being on the stage? He actually took a wrestling practice to the student union so that people could see it. Is there anyone doing more for the sport than Brian Smith? Well, there's a, there are other great coaches, but yes, but Brian is excellent because of anybody who knows Brian, who knows where Missouri was when he took over it. I mean, they weren't even close. Of course, they were competing in the Big Eight, Big Twelve at that time against Oklahoma State, Iowa State, Oklahoma, and it was a you know, it was a tough journey up. But he knew he's an individual who knows how to get his community excited. He also knows that he's at a university where it's one of the number one journalism schools. So he got his guys to talk to the journalists to spread the word. I mean, so it's a great story. And now the fact that the NCAAs again are going to be at St. Louis, it, it, it generates a lot of buzz. And so Brian Smith is great. He's great for the University of Missouri. He's also great for the entire sport as with his duties with the National Wrestling Coaches Association. On the line with Mike Fan of Wrestling Insider News Magazine, known as Win. Win has Oklahoma State as the top team in the nation. And maybe a little argument for me. I know that there's a, you have a system in place on how you get to what the number one team is. I think it's going to be Penn State. Do you realistically think that Oklahoma State is going to be on top of the heap at the end of the year? Well, at, at this point, because they have, they have more depth. At Penn State, you've got what you've got three individuals who who've been in the finals. So yes, they should be strong. But there is some question about some of these young, other young guys, uh, and that's without Mark Hall. But yes, I mean Penn State should be strong. But again, the University of Iowa should be. We should be talking with about the Hawkeyes right now as well. They've got three returning finalists as well, and and two of them are ranked number one of their weight class at one twenty five and one thirty three with Gilman and Clark. So uh, it, it will be fun. We've got a long ways to go. Um, I, I am a little bit surprised at Virginia Tech. I mean, they are good. I, for some reason, I expect a little bit more from them right now. I have not really seen it. Uh, and then, listen, we cannot forget Ohio State. You know, yeah. uh, and the fact that Kyle Snyder has already wrestled uh, in a dual meet, uh, you know, at Arizona State last weekend, uh, you know, last year he didn't wrestle until a week, what, two weeks before the postseason. So it, it's, that was fun. I just think uh, we've got some great teams right now, and all of these teams have some great young talent, so they're going to be around for a while. You, you live in Iowa City, Coralville area. What, what's Iowa's identity as far as being a, a wrestling program right now? They've, uh, they've gone through some transition. They won three in a row from uh, 2008 to 2010. Then it's been the Penn State uh, show for the most part. Ohio State got in there in 2015. What, where is Iowa in all of this? Well, I think Iowa's hungry. You're talking about the, are you talking about the fan base or the coaching? I, I think just because, overall the, the, the Iowa wrestling product, which uh, is known for that domination, and, and maybe you haven't seen as much lately, but are, are they back on track to that? 
Well, they they are, but once again, let's wait until they're they're actually taken on the Big Ten competition. Let's see what happens when they host Penn State in January. That'll be fun to see. The the question about Iowa, you cannot. Well, first of all, you cannot question their intensity and how much they're going to be uh, go after everybody. But the question is, do they have the skill level to compete against the Penn State? Because if anything, that the Sandersons, Casey Cunningham, have done a great job in developing very skilled wrestlers. Sometimes, unfortunately, that's you're wondering: Does Iowa these guys? They're great, you know, they're great wrestlers, but do they show their skills when it matters most? If they do that, they will beat Penn State, not just in a duel, but when it comes to the Big Ten tournament and at the NCAA's. And it is, isn't it pretty amazing when you think about Iowa? They got fifth last year, and I know that uh, they are always striving for that top spot, but they really don't lose momentum in their fan base. That's a credit to the Iowa wrestling program. Oh, oh, definitely. The fact that what they had over 42,000 in an yeah. outdoor duel a year ago, and, and even had the weather not been great, I still think they would have had that much at, at such an event. Yeah, I mean, the, the Iowa fan base, um, I, they, are, they are second to none. And I have, obviously people can say, well, Mike, because, Mike, you live there. You know, you understand you're close to it. But they keep proving it every year. Yeah. You know, even when they're not the top-ranked team in the country, they're still there. Now, what Kel Sanderson is doing at Penn State, I think, is very close. I think, you know, they, they've, they've had the base, but they have not really gotten excited until the Sandersons came in. Because they know the, the, the state of Pennsylvania has great wrestling. And and but what Sanderson's doing there, I I, I think I'm not sure if they were, that fan base is where the University of Iowa is, but it sure is darn close. On the line with Mike Finn of Wrestling Insider News Magazine, we talked about Oklahoma State, and that's led by John Smith, who really has evolved as a wrestling coach. You've been around uh-huh. him with being at NBC. What have you yeah. seen with John that has got it, uh-huh. gotten him to this point that he's become such a a progressive minded coach? Well, my mind is, I, I think is when his son Joey started wrestling for him a year ago, I think he really started seeing wrestlers differently. He had to be. You have to be to see what's going on. And, and, and I think he's become a lot more perspective. You know, he is really now one of the veteran coaches. When, when Coach Taylor from Ryder steps down, you know, uh, John's going to be one of the top guys up there in longevity. I can't believe he's been over there 25 years in Stillwater. I mean, when I think of John Smith, I think of this young wrestler. You know, you got this mindset, this this young, almost a kid. You know, so he's eternally young as a coach. You know, and but uh, he's he's but he's a guy who's done a great job in 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 and I guess getting people excited about Oklahoma State wrestling again. And they are they are showing it. They are going to be a fun team to watch. We are in the post Jay Robinson years of Minnesota. He was so identified with that program and how we viewed it. Where does Minnesota go from here? Well, they're still at a pause in my mind. I mean, we'll see. They're doing actually not doing that bad right now. Uh, but you know, who are they going to actually hire as their full time coach? I don't think they've determined that yet. I just find this thing with Jay just sad. Uh, you know, I everybody knows Jay. Everybody knows Jay is the type of guy who had such strong beliefs in what he's doing. Perhaps maybe it's not what the university wanted to hear or the authorities or what was going on up there. But it's just sad that a guy who had been part of a, a, a dynasty, maybe not a dynasty, but such a legend in the sport, all of a sudden just to be gone like that. It, it, it's, it's so hard for me to even think about this year. I, I still believe that I'm going to see Jay in the corner when I see the Gophers wrestle, and it's, so this is hard. We've talked about some of the big names in the sport, whether it's returning medalists from the Olympics or defending NCAA champions. Who are a couple guys that you've seen that are flying under the radar a little bit that we can get excited about? Wow, wow. Um, boy, I tell you what. Now, are we talking about coaches or wrestlers? Oh, or probably wrestlers. Or what? I think wrestlers. I think we know the, the big names, whether it's the Zane Rutherfords. Right. Or the uh, the Kyle Snyders, the Jaden Coxes. Is there someone well, out there that uh, we may not be talking about that we can get excited well, about? Well, I think you're going to have to, you're going to eventually have to be talking about Arizona State. Uh, okay. With Zig Jones, with him bringing the, the Valencia brothers, uh, Zahid and, and Anthony, uh, who could contest for uh, All-American honors this year. Uh, and he's got some other good young talent there, too. Uh, so, yeah, so that's a program. You know, Nebraska tends to get overlooked sometimes. Yeah. The Huskers, uh, I, I think, are good. Lehigh this year out east. I'm not sure if they're going to beat Cornell for the IWA, but they're close. 
Uh, they're going to have a dual meet with them coming up here. That'll that'll be fun to check out. Um, it's so, and then you know you got programs like South Dakota State yeah. uh, that tends to get overlooked a bit. But for what you know, what they're doing up there is is very impressive. So I, it, that will be fun to see. Um, uh, you know, again, you know what Kevin Jackson has done at Iowa State. He's he, he, they they fell a bit, but I do see them uh, coming back. They've proven it in the past couple postseasons, and so so that will be good at, at the University of Oklahoma uh, with Lou Roselli taking over that program. Um, how how far are, are they? From getting back in there, it, it once again there's some good young, and I just believe it because there's so many good young coaches now that are getting the most out of these very talented kids, kids that are coming out of high school with skills and they take it to another level. That's the key. Yeah, and it seems like all these coaches have that expectation that we want to win a national team tournament, even though we know it's probably not realistic. They don't care. No, they don't care. They don't care. But they have the best attitude uh, about this. That you know, you ask about Iowa earlier. I, I do think it's tough for the fan base for uh, not for, for them not to see the Hawkeyes on top again. It's it, this has been hard, you know. So I, I do think this is a year with the NCAA's being in St. Louis. Don't be surprised if, if the Hawkeyes do turn it on once they get there. Uh, it's uh, that that'll be fun. But I just uh, you know again, it's there can only be one team champion in, in the NCAA yep. tournament, and that's tough because it it tends to repeat itself, and so you sort of forget. What other people's are doing? I, I wish we could find a way to. If you are a top four team, I wish there was a way for us. That, that, I mean, the sport to get even more excited about them, you hey. know, and you know, almost give them medals like they do in the Olympics. Mike, you're from Waterloo, uh, and, and I know you well, but I don't know what kind of music you listen to. What were you rocking <laughs> out to in the in the early seventies? Oh my God! Huh? Oh, early the, well, Fleetwood Mac. Fleetwood Mac. I mean. Oh yeah, oh yeah, that's that type of thing. Uh, uh, you know, it was. <laughs> that, well, I guess I wanted. I have to. I had to think back more about that. Those those <laughs> eras. But uh, that, <laughs> do, you, do you have an iPod? Music, or are you still music? records? Oh, oh, you know that's so funny. I went and actually looked at a, a record player the other night. I because we do have actually albums from those days. Yeah, and it would be fun to play them again. And it, yeah. but when you see if you go some places. They're actually marketing that to young people right they now, are. And, and it's fun. They are. Well, we've had uh, a lot of fun here. Thanks for joining us. Uh, we always appreciate your insight on the sport and, uh, and giving us a great, uh, great thought as we move forward in the season. So thanks for filling the big shoes of Doug Van Gelder. You bet. Anytime, Kyle. All right. That was uh, Mike Finn of Wrestling Insider News Magazine. Up next, some history with Afsoon Johnston. Next, on the mat, 1650 The Fan. 1650 The Fan, KCNZ. We are back on the mat, 1650 The Fan. I am Kyle Klingman of the National Wrestling Hall of Fame Dan Gable Museum. And Scott, you know I love history, and we have a great piece of history in our second segment. Afsoon Johnston was the very first medalist for the United States at the Women's World Championship Got a bronze medal in 1989. Great story that I just want to dive into, Afsoon. Welcome to the program. Thank you so much for having me. And in learning about your story, I think the best way to start is where you came from. You came from Iran to the United States. Take us through your journey and how you arrived in the United States. Right, yeah, I sure will. Well, I was born uh, in Iran, and as you know, Iran is a country that um, unfortunately doesn't have the same rights uh, for women as we do here in the United States. And so born um, in the early 70s in Iran, um, wrestling is huge in Iran. It's the national sport. And so my father was a a big wrestler in Iran and um, competed internationally for Iran. And, of course, had always wanted a son to follow in his footsteps and to carry the family tradition with wrestling. And um, I'm an only child and ended up being female. So, uh, you know, any hopes for him to continue the sport within our family of wrestling would have been me. So he took one look at me and said, well, I guess you're it. You're my only child. And the fact that you're, you're female isn't going to stop me from teaching you wrestling. But, um, of course, you know, we were in Iran. So it, it, being in Iran, it wasn't where we could publicly um, wrestle. And so... 
in our own house, in our own apartment at the time, um, growing up, um, that was the thing that my dad and I did, and it bonded us. We had wrestling, and my dad would teach me wrestling technique, and uh, we would move the living room tables, and my mom would referee the matches, and sometimes my dad would let me beat him, and other times he taught me that wrestling is a tough sport, and you, you got to, you know, struggle and learn, and um shapes your character and so the fact that I was female I was his his little girl never stopped him from realizing that the sport of wrestling is such an awesome sport that it it really does benefit all boys or girls and so I grew up with that and having wrestling and knowing the technique and knowing what a wonderful great sport it was but unfortunately, I wasn't allowed to talk about it outside of my home because living in Iran, a country where, you know, girls just didn't do that. Women weren't even really allowed in, in a stadium to watch wrestling. And, um, you know, the revolution that occurred in Iran and things tightened up even even more so. And there was a war going on between Iran and Iraq in the, you know, late 70s, early 80s. And so my parents knew that really there was going to be no future for me um, as a female wanting to, you know, just pretty much just having equal rights. And so I think my parents made the ultimate sacrifice for their child for me and uh, left everything they knew and, um, and really fled to the United States because we came to the United States as political refugees, as political asylums. Um, in in the early 80s, in 1983, and started a new life here in the United States. Um, it was very risky, um, the way we ended up getting out of Iran and um, moving to the United States, but my parents knew that that's the sacrifice they needed to make in order for me to have a better future, their only child. And, and, and you got involved in wrestling through the... the venue of high school wrestling. How did you yes. get to that point where you <laughs> felt comfortable enough to actually uh, compete with a high school boys team in California? Right. So what happened, again, and, you know, this is still early 80s, which women's wrestling wasn't really even uh, it heard of or really popular here in the United States, yet alone, you know, Iran. And so um, I wanted to so fit in with being an all-American girl, and so what I did is decided to go out for uh, high school cheerleading as a freshman because, you know, that's, that's what, what a lot of the, the girls in the United States did their freshman year in high school. And so I, I ended up um, during winter season when it was uh, wrestling season in high school, some of the cheerleaders cheered for basketball and others kept stats for the wrestling. And so since I had grown up around wrestling and knew wrestling well, I decided that that's what I wanted to do. But in watching the high school matches, I realized, wait a minute, I, this is what I've been doing all my life. I know how to wrestle. My dad's taught me this technique. And so I approached the high school coach um, my high school coach at Independence High School up in Northern California in San Jose, and I said, you know, um, I want to go out for your boys' wrestling team. I know how to wrestle, and I want to do this. And uh, the coach, who actually happened to be David Shade, um, you know, his son Danny Shade was a big, big wrestler here for us in the United States. Um, he, he Wrestling was huge at Independence High School where I was going. They had been state champions, and it just powerhouse. Um, of a wrestling team in Northern California. And so he, he didn't want, you know, his wrestling program to really at that time consider, you know, being watered down by allowing this, this girl on the team. And so he called my dad um, in hopes that, you know, he could, he could kind of tattletale on me to my dad. You know what your daughter is trying to do? She's trying to go out for the boys, my boys high school wrestling team. Right. And, you know, ironically, my dad, being such a big supporter of me in wrestling with his thick Iranian accent, said, oh, I think that's great. I think it's wonderful that my daughter wants to wrestle boys in high school. <laughs> and so I think that kind of uh, backfired on the coach. And so early on, you know, it, it was all eyes on me. I had to prove what, what was my motivation for wanting to go out for a boys high school wrestling team. You know, where it's almost a no-win situation with with a girl having, you know, on an all-boys wrestling team. That was the thought process anyways back then. 
And so, you know, there was some challenges, and basically I had to really prove myself that, yes, I was out there for the right reasons. I was out there because of my love for the sport of wrestling, because I wanted the same things out of the sport of wrestling as any boy, as any uh, wrestler would want. And so I think the next, in the course of the next four years of wrestling high school, um, varsity, um, I really, I, I think, changed the coach's mind in that um, he became like a second father to me and a big supporter of women in wrestling. And by the time I was a senior in high school, now we're talking about 1989, 1990, women's wrestling, girls' wrestling in the high schools had really grown. And so no longer was I the only one in the state of California. More and more girls were coming out for boys' wrestling, and it was really starting to gain some, some popularity and some momentum and so by my senior year in high school, in 1989, um, USA Wrestling um, organized the first national team for United States and uh, sent a national team over to compete at the very first world championships um, that included women. And it was the men's world championships in Martigny, Switzerland in 1989, and for the first time they had added uh, the women's division. And so... There was a, a team of five of us that went, and um, I was the first weight class to medal, and so therefore I guess that that's where you know that that first world medal for United States came to be. But um, we just had a wonderful team and um, girls that really had beat a lot of odds to prove that they they wanted to wrestle, and um, from there it gained a lot more momentum, and we you know kept having the world championships, and it and it grew and. As you know now, we just made history this past Olympics and won our very first uh, women's Olympic gold medal in Helen. So we've come a long ways. <laughs> On the line with Afsoon Johnston, the first female medalist at the Women's World Championships. That took place in 1989, and you just uh, talked about that a little bit. But uh, pretty primitive at the time, but you had some interactions with the Iranian team. Take us through what that was like to, to see some of your former, uh, I, I don't want to say teammates, but uh, people you may have known during uh, during that time. Sure, sure. So, um, you know, in 1989, when we had the first world championships along the men's wrestling, you know, of course, I was very excited to go and meet the men's um, Iranian national team because they, they had just been really my, my heroes as well as the U.S. men's um, national team members. And so when I spotted the Iranian national team at the 89 World Championships, I was excited to go approach them and uh, introduce myself. And so I did so, you know, to, extended my hand in shaking them as I introduced myself. And their reaction was, you know, we think it's wonderful what you're doing. However, you are a female and we're not allowed to shake your hand. And so at that time, unfortunately, um, because of the political situation, um, I could tell, that, again, the people of Iran love Americans and they, they support women's wrestling. Um, but because of the political climate there, um, it, it definitely <laughs> makes it um, they're, you know, awkward as a woman or not. The, it's not acceptable. But um, the, on the positive side, at the, in 1989 World Championships, um, the opening ceremonies, uh, Matt Gaffari was on that team from the United States. Now, he's a fellow Iranian. And he was, um, you know, on the national team, USA national team, too. And so it was really, really neat because I remember um, sitting on his shoulders as we're parading out with the opening ceremonies and we're holding the U.S. flag. And we just thought how great of a country, you know, that we are representing now where, you know, here's two immigrants that are able to have these opportunities in, in, in this country. And another interesting point that uh, I just realized from talking to you last week was instead of an Outstanding Wrestler Award, they gave what? Yes. So, you know, honestly, Kyle, if I hadn't lived it, I almost wouldn't believe what, <laughs> what, what was happening in those right. early years. And so in 1990, what they did is they separated women's wrestling from men's wrestling, the venue. We, 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 in 1990, our world championships, the women's world championships, was held in Lulia, Sweden, um, on its own. Um, 
And at that World Championships, um, I, I got the silver medal and had a chance to go up on the podium, which was super exciting, of course, for me. And as I received my medal, they also, you know how they hand out a second, like a trophy or a, a, a something from that country or whatever it is usually on the podium. Well, I was shocked to find out the second thing that they were handing out to the women. And so here, my, my teammate got a coffee maker. I got a saute pan. And uh, you wouldn't believe that we didn't know how to take it, to be honest. Like, on one hand, we've come a long ways, and we're competing at the World Championships, which is a dream of ours, you know, for wrestling. And on the other hand, we're being awarded on the podium with kitchen appliances. And so wasn't quite sure what kind of message that was sending. And to, to add, you know, um, it, it, insult to the wound was for the Outstanding Wrestler Award, there was no Outstanding Wrestler Award, but instead it was the Most Beautiful Wrestler Award. <laughs> and so they did actually call out one of the wrestlers and gave her, put a tiara on her head, almost like a beauty pageant, and awarded her the most beautiful wrestler award of that tournament. And it is hard to, to believe, given that that was 1990 or more in 2016, that that would have even happened. But it did. And right. you're right that when you hear right. that, you kind of scratch your head and wonder. But as you think about the progress of where we are today with Helen Maroulis winning the first Olympic gold medal for the United States, what right. changed what, in your mind? What, what made the progress? Was there a, a moment that really got us to that point that we're, uh, we're really embracing women's wrestling? I think a couple of things. I think, you know, as, as uh, the general population, the U.S. wrestling population started accepting, and actually the world as well, ex- accepting more um, women's wrestling, and as, as the technique progressed and as coaches started accepting women and girls more into the wrestling rooms, we were able to technically advance, and given more opportunities, we were able to show that um, – Women's wrestling is an exciting sport to watch and that we can be technically sound and, and have progressed a lot um, in just what's going on on the mat. Um, but also, I think, if you ask me, was there an actual point that helped progress it, I think it, the realization after we, as a sport, were dropped from the after 2012 Olympics, I think a lot of people realized that we do need women's wrestling for all of wrestling. If you exclude half the population, if you exclude women and not support it, that just hurts men's wrestling as well. That hurts our sport as a whole. And so if we can be inclusive, and that's what wrestling has always been known for. That's our strength in our sport, is wrestling is an all-inclusive sport. It doesn't discriminate against, you know, size. There's weight classes for everybody. It doesn't discriminate against, you know, gender, race, socioeconomics. And, and why should we discriminate against gender? And so with including women, it just has really helped our sport and, uh, and I think that realization has really helped women's wrestling progress more to where it is today. Have you gotten to know Adeline Gray and Helen Maroulis throughout your wrestling journey? Yes, yes. They are phenomenal athletes, really. Both Helen and Adeline, um, I believe, is, they're, they're the absolute best in the world. And so here we are, you know, United States, and we have the two best wrestlers in the world um, right here in, in, you know, homegrown. The program that Terry Steiner um, is putting with the women's national team is just phenomenal, and I've been lucky enough to um, be able to observe it and, um, you know, get a few coaching assignments to be able to be a part of that program. Um, but it ha- it's just phenomenal how much our national team coach, Terry Steiner, puts his heart, soul, and time um, and everything into this program and how far he's brought it. Um, like I said, kudos to him. And it's really, really neat for me to see that we have progressed this far in my lifetime. Because had you asked me, would we have, you know, an Olympic gold medalist? And in Adeline, Adeline didn't have it the best Olympics, but in my mind, and I'm sure in everybody else's mind, she's still the best in the world. And so we have the two best, you know, wrestlers. And really, our other two wrestlers could have made the podium and, and won too. You know how the Olympics on any given day, anything could happen. 
but Haley's a phenomenal wrestler as well. And so really, um, we have such an amazing program. We've come such a long way, and I'm just really happy that it happened in my lifetime because, honestly, um, from where I started, I-, I wouldn't have guessed that the progress we could make in-, in these years. Now, we still have some ways to go um, to continue, you know, the support for women's wrestling and equality, but like I said, we've come a long ways, and we're very, very fortunate to have coaches like Terry Steiner that um, really are helping our program. We've been talking with Afsoon Johnston, made a piece of history in 1989, becoming the first female from the United States to win a medal at the Women's World Championship. We've enjoyed having you on. I want to end with this. If Afsoon Johnston's rocking out in her car, what song do you got blurring? <laughs> oh, my. You know, the, the ironic is, thing is I have three kids, and here's the thing. You can be a mom. You can be a wrestler. You can be a wife. So it's probably some kind of a kid tune. Oh, yeah. I don't know if that's what you expected <laughs> to hear, but yeah. you know, oh, you know which one I, my kids and I both all enjoy is Katy Perry's "Roar." All right, that's a that's a good song. Seems uh, seems fitting for uh, for what you're doing, uh, advancing the sport. So, hey, we appreciate it. Thanks for coming on the program. Love to have you on again. But uh, thanks for joining us today. Absolutely. Thanks so much, Kyle. All right, thank you. Up next, we have Scott Goodale. He set some made some history of his own. He's next on the mat. The Cedar Valley Sports Station, 1650 The Fan, KCNZ. We are back on the mat, 1650 The Fan. I am Kyle Klingman of the National Wrestling Hall of Fame, Dan Gable Museum. Our final segment is with a coach who made history. The stat line reads like this. Number 10, Rutgers defeated Princeton 19-16. to The duel started at 125 pounds. The location of the duel, High Point Solution Stadium outside in Piscataway, New Jersey, attendance 16,178, which is second all-time for a college wrestling dual meet. That means there was no Iowa in it, no Oklahoma State, no Penn State, no Minnesota. Sitting in second place, Rutgers, and we have the head coach of the program, Scott Goodale, with us. How are you, Scott? Good, Kyle. I'm doing all right. Thanks for having me on. Hey, great to have you on. And, and when you hear that, you had 16,178 people for a dual meet outside. That has to feel real good. Yeah, it's exciting. You know, uh, sitting around, I, I talk with Coach Leonardo, so I don't know if you know, it's been with me since day one. And before the National Anthem, we looked up, and it was pretty cool to see that sea of red with some orange flashed in there and, you know, everything that's been put in the last 10 years. And we remember wrestling, you know, in front of 15 people, our first college duel, January 4th, 2008, when the clock broke down for 20 minutes and we had to go out to a truck and pick up an old clock just to use and a stopwatch and a flip card so we've come a long way it was exciting it was uh it was a great day for for new, not only new jersey wrestling but for the country and you continue to grow the sport but uh you know we felt good about it and uh we'd like to wrestle a little bit better but you know it is what it is it's a great event it was a good day and we're excited about that take us back to how this transpired it went back several months ago when you got this uh generated got the buzz going take us through the steps on how you got to this point well, I always wanted to do it. I always said I was going to do it, and Iowa kind of beat me to it. So that was kind of upsetting. But, you know, again, uh, seven, eight months in the making, figured we needed I, – I didn't think we'd wrestle a Big Ten duel, so I figured we needed a big draw. Who was going to help us? Who was going to help us? Like you said earlier, we're not – right now, we're not Penn State, Minnesota, Iowa, or Oki State. So I needed to find a group of, of coaches on the other end that was going to really, really help us to market this thing and build this thing and work their tails off to sell tickets. So I thought of Princeton, Coach Ayers, up-and-coming program, uh, a lot of major donors within their program, a great history within their program. Really two programs for a while there were on the brink of being lost, you know, maybe 10 years ago. So um, I just thought of that and, and knew Chris would work his tail off and his staff. So that's exactly what happened. And it was, uh, it was there were daily meetings and daily talks with both staffs and, you know, our, our our administration did a great job with it. Their administration did a great job with it. Our fil- facilities department, and and that's kind of how it went. Like I said, weeks and weeks of, you know, meetings and things like that. But it, we got a perfect day, so it worked out. We're in the Midwest, and maybe we don't understand the uh, the rivalry between Rutgers and Princeton. Is it uh, is it the rivalry you have? Is it a big rivalry? Where does that uh, stand for you guys? You know, it's something that that we want it. We want it to be a rivalry, and uh, we've been successful since I've been here with them. We've always looked at Lehigh, and this is no knock on Princeton. Lehigh's always been our our focal point. Somebody we've always been chasing. We have a good rivalry with Lehigh, and at first that was our first 
inclination is let's call up Lehigh and see if, if they'll do it. And they were interested but had a dual meet and didn't want to change it. So it just didn't work out with Lehigh. And then the next best thing was certainly Princeton. And, and there's, a, there's a rival. The battle at the birthplace comes from obviously the college football, first ever college football game here. So it kind of made sense uh, that it was Princeton. And that's, that was another big reason. But it's, uh, it, it's certainly going to turn into something really – really need this rivalry because they're such an up-and-coming program and they're doing such a good job. So we'll try to keep pace with that and continue to wrestle them. On the line with Scott Goodale, he's the head wrestling coach at Rutgers. His program, along with Princeton, number two all-time, 16,178 people came to the outdoor dual meet on November 19th. And feedback, what did you get from fans? What did they tell you about what they thought about the meet? I'll tell you what, nothing but uh, nothing but positives. I haven't other than my mother, you know, talking about the handicap parking and how far she had to walk to get on a bus, everything was everything was good. There wasn't there wasn't too many negatives. Again, it was sixty two degrees and sunny. Eight hours later for the football game, there was snow falling. Hmm. So, you know, I just think you know the lines were, were long to get on the buses. We delayed the match for about ten minutes, but uh, other than that, it was it was a great great venue, a great atmosphere, easy to see the mat. Um, it was really, really sunny, which made it hard to see the riding time. But honestly, I think that only affected the coaches on both sides and maybe the, probably not even the wrestlers. But the fans had a big scoreboard. They could see riding time and, and, the, and the clock. So um, there was no negative, really, to be honest with you. It was all positive. And, and, and I think what really made it was it was a great dual meet. You know, there were upsets. There were nationally ranked guys getting beat. Uh, you know, there was, there was a lot of good things happening, and, and that's what made for, for a great afternoon. As far as the athletes, uh, you, you talked about the fans. What did the athletes say about that experience, especially on your team, about going out there, being outside, and adapting a little bit? Yeah, you know, I don't. Uh, we we trained it. We trained in it. We got up early in the morning and wrestled in forty degree weather. We had a couple practices outside, so we were kind of prepared. Just like I believe Princeton was prepared for it because they trained in it. So it was actually a nicer day than what we were prepared for. So I don't think it had anything. Nobody, we haven't even talked about it with our guys. Like, was it different? Was it, was it a little bit uncomfortable? Were you comfortable? It was just a normal wrestling match. So we never even brought it up. It's over and done with. We, we critiqued the way we wrestled, and it had nothing to do with the weather or, or being outside or the atmosphere. So it would just happen to be a wrestling match in front of 16,000 people, and that's the way we, 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 we took it. Again, we, we critiqued ourselves and where we got to get better, you know, in all three areas, but we didn't talk anything about the weather or anything like that. Being outside, there's a, a different dynamic on how you feel the, the crowd around you. W- when you're inside, you can feel that uh, when there's an exciting match, it really does get loud. Yeah. Did it get loud outside? It, it was loud. It was loud, and our fans are really, really into it, so you heard the chance of two, but it's not the same as if we were in the rack, which would, would have been unbelievable to have 8,000 in the rack compared to 16,000 outside. I mean, again, great experience. That's not the negative. It's just... They're not right on, especially in a football stadium, and the way our football stadium is shaped, they're not exactly right on top of the mat. So it was loud. The people on the outside said it was unbelievably loud, but being right next to the mat, it was hard to hear, and it was like a delayed echo, you know. So it was a little bit different, uh, not quite like being at the rack, but still it was pretty cool. Now, I know that nobody wants to be number two, but this is a special piece of history. I think you would embrace that, hey, you, you have a nice slice of history right now. I hope you're proud of that. Yeah, I am. I'm proud of it. I'm proud of our, you know, I'm proud of our whole administration, how we all work together. It is pretty neat to, you know, to say we're the second, you know, highest attendant wrestling match ever. Uh, and again, I just think about where it's come from, you know, and that's what's kind of made it, it make, makes it even a little bit more special. But it, it is, it's not, like you said earlier, man, it's not Penn State, Minnesota, Iowa, Oklahoma State, it's Princeton Rutgers and I'm just glad to have a little bit of peace of it, for sure. On the line with Scott Goodell, head wrestling coach at Rutgers, and you said uh, where you come from. You were a high school wrestling coach that became a college wrestling coach. Uh, take us through how that happened and how you got into the college game. Yeah, it's, uh, it's kind of a unique story. Man. I was, uh, we had some really good years at Jackson. All I ever wanted to do was come back from Lock Haven and go to my alma mater, Jackson High School in New Jersey, and just build this, this monster of a program, whether it be football or wrestling. I was also a football offense coordinator. So I just enjoyed coaching at that level, and I wanted that whole town. It's where I grew up. I just wanted that whole town to just to be a wrestling town. And, and we got it to that point, and, and I just had some opportunity. It was just an opportunity. I wasn't expecting this job. It was Bill Ward who asked me to write up a five-point plan, how can we make Rutgers better. 
And uh, I did it over, you know, on a piece, on a napkin, over a glass of wine with my wife. And the next thing you know, I was on a six-hour interview on how to make Rutgers wrestling better. And I just thought this was an opportunity. Maybe I can't pass up. And uh, that, that's exactly how it happened. And I, I accepted the job. And like I said, our first little meet, we had eight, 18 to 20 people at the match. So <laughs> uh, it's, it's a crazy story. It's, it's probably too long for this phone call, but uh, it's a unique story. And it's, uh, you know, I've been, I've been blessed to really be around some good people. And you've got to surround yourself with some, some great, great people. And I've been fortunate enough to, to do that. And uh, even to this day, I'm around some great people that make this job real easy. Even if, as you talk about that, when we talk about this uh, this great turnout, and then being part of the Big Ten, being a Big Ten coach, what what yeah. has that done for Rutgers to be in the Big Ten? Has that been a good thing overall? It has been, and it's been a good thing. You know, everybody asks me that: how has it helped recruiting? And to be honest, the recruiting it's it's put us in the discussion with the best guys in the country. It doesn't mean it's it's actually gotten harder because that's who we're competing for now. Because the only way we're going to survive and win is to get the best guys in the country. So and everybody will say, well, you're right there in New Jersey. You have a great home state. Not everybody wants to stay home. So it's been hard. And, again, they got to be the best guys in the country. We can't, you know, just settle for guys that work hard. You know, the coach always says, well, work hard. So being in the Big Ten has been, has been, has been uh, you know, not difficult. It's been fun. It's been great. It's been a super, super huge challenge. And uh, one we've embraced. And, and then, obviously, the level of the, of the competition every night, every single night you need to be ready to go. And that's probably been the hardest thing, and I think our guys have done a really good job with it, uh, handling it over the last three years. And we got to do, we got to continue to do a good job because it doesn't get easier. Is and, that, uh, but but being, go ahead. No, I was going to say, is that a, a recruiting pitch when you you talk about it getting easier? But you have some nice perks that you get to be on the Big Ten yeah. Network. Is that something those yeah. athletes like? I think so. You know, I think it, it gives us a lot of visibility. You know, we're going to be on the Big Ten Network four times this year, so it gives us. Uh, it gives us a, a lot of visibility, and then you know our home matches now. You know this state is crazy about this sport. It, they love this sport: New Jersey, Ohio, Pennsylvania, Iowa. Right? They all they love wrestling. So we get to bring schools in from the Big Ten Conference, like Iowa, to Penn State, to Minnesota. Our our place is packed, so we use that as a recruiting pitch. We wrestle in front of five thousand, you know, every single night because of who we're wrestling, and and because we're getting better too, and we're. We're exciting, and, and all that stuff goes into it, and obviously the conference helps. And, you know, we could have went the other way real, real easy, but our guys, credit to them, have really stepped up their game and, and gotten better and trained, you know, all year round now and lived a lifestyle, and that's the type of kid we're recruiting. So, and it had to go that way. Otherwise, it could have been a long, could have been a long wrestling season for years. On the line with Scott Goodell, head wrestling coach at Rutgers, Rutgers, had an attendance of 16,178 on Saturday, November 19th, and that was against Princeton, won the dual meet, 19-16. to 16. And as you look forward about what, uh, what you have expectations for, it's always fun to make progress and, and have these great meets, but I know that you're pointing toward March and, and what you can get with, uh, with All-Americans and possible national champs. What, uh, what's your feel for how you guys are going to develop throughout the season? Well, that's it. We just we, we got to continue to get better. Uh, you know, we, we got a really good lineup. We got some some nine. We've returned nine national qualifiers, a Big Ten champ, and all two time All American. And, and like I said, that experience of going to the tournament is is really really important. I feel. And we even got a couple All American, or I'm sorry, a couple of national qualifiers that aren't in our starting lineup right now. So there's a lot of depth. There's a lot of talent. It, but it's how you execute and really make the most of the talent is what we need to do, and, and we're doing that now. We've got to get better from Saturday, and hopefully this Sunday coming up, we have a better version of what we were last week and the week before, and that's really, I know that sounds boring and it's old cliche, but you try to get better, you know, 1% better every day, and that's really what we're trying to do, and it's a, it's a long, it's, a, it's not a sprint, it's a marathon, it's a long year, and we've got to gauge these athletes that way, and make sure we're healthy and make sure we're living right. And if we do that, we'll be there in March. We'll be there at the end. And, you know, hopefully at the end of the day, we're having the same Big Ten tournament we had last year where we scored over 100 points. We're fifth in our conference. So we're going to try to keep that same model and continue to do what we've been doing and, and be ready to go come March. Blair Academy is a national high school program that's recognized for its great wrestling tradition, which happens to be in New Jersey. Do you guys have a connect there with uh, Blair? We, we, we do have a connection. Our assistant coach is from Blair, John Leonardis. Haven't been at, we've only had a handful of guys in our lineup, but that's obviously what we got to recruit, you know, to be able to compete. And, uh, 
uh, we're on. We already got an early commitment from one of their guys now. So it's a school we're definitely, uh, definitely we talk to quite a bit. You still following mixed martial arts? I do. Yeah. Well, Frankie's my guy. So, yeah. Yeah. You know, Frankie's my guy. So uh, he's been in the room quite a bit training for the fight. Um, so, yeah, as long as he's going to go, I'm going to continue to follow it. And uh, we just got to make sure he gets a big fight again. Is that uh, is MMA been good for wrestling? I think so. Yeah, I think so. I mean, it's, yeah, it's, these guys are all trained in wrestling. You know, the best fighters, I think, are wrestlers. So they all want to train in this type of mixed martial art. You know, we get a lot of guys in our room. So I think it's been good. Yeah, definitely. It's worth mentioning again, uh, second all-time attendance between the University of Iowa, which uh, set the mark last year with over 42,000. 16,178 people came to the Rutgers Princeton meet, where Rutgers won 19 to 16. Head coach of that program has been on the line with us. Scott, thanks for joining us. It's always fun to have you on. You do have a great story, and I, I hope uh, more people will continue to, uh, to learn about Rutgers and uh, realize what a great job you're doing there. Thanks, Kyle. I appreciate you having me, man. All right, that uh, that was a lot of fun. Again, uh, what what a great piece of history to have on there. It doesn't have uh, the University of Iowa in it. It doesn't have a lot of the major programs that you think of. But uh, Rutgers and Princeton now have the uh, the number two spot for attendance. Sixteen thousand one hundred and seventy eight people. It was fun to have Scott Goodale on the program for Mike Finn and Afsoon Johnston. I'm Kyle Klingman. You've been listening to On the Mat, sixteen fifty, the Fan. You've been listening to On The Mat, the Cedar Valley's longest-running radio show devoted entirely to wrestling. Brought to you by Rolling Ford and the National Wrestling Hall of Fame Dan Gable Museum on 1650 The Fan. This show is part of the Matt Talk Podcast Network. For more wrestling podcasts, head over to matttalkonline.com.